afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Renewable Energy Trading Opportunities for Emerging Merchant RE Business Models. My name is Christian, uh, Project Manager at Soda Plaza, and with me is my colleague Marco and my colleague Afonso as well. Today, we're going to talk about renewable energy trading and the opportunities for emerging merchant uh, RE business models. And this is our webinar program for today. Peter Osbeltstone will be giving a presentation. He is a research director at Wood Mackenzie, and he's currently leading the European Power Research Team. And subsequently, the presentation will be followed by a Q&A. And the goal of this webinar is to provide you more information on the opportunities of emerging merchant RE business models. And among other things, Peter will tell us more about the evolving RE and solar PV markets in Europe, uh, the way business models and routes to market are changing and development and impact of long-term power prices on project returns. And after the presentation, there will be room for questions from your side in the Q&A. But before we continue, I would like to introduce Solar Plaza to you briefly. Our mission is to positively impact the world by accelerating the sustainable energy transition. And through our events, newsletters, and news portal, we help renewable energy professionals become more effective in their business development uh, by providing unique networking opportunities and high level content. And since 2004, we have organized more than 125 events all across the globe in more than 35 countries. And this means in the upcoming months, we have some exciting events coming up. Uh, such as our floating solar conference in Amsterdam next week, uh, which will be our first event about, uh, about floating solar. Uh, but as well, we have the, the Solar Future Hungary and the Solar Future Greece coming up, and of course, the Renewable Energy Trading Summit itself, uh, which is taking place in parallel and co-located with our Solar Asset Management Europe conference. And this webinar is in, in anticipation of the RE Trading Summit which we are organizing together with the European Federation of Energy Traders. And this event is taking place on the 31st of October in Frankfurt. And the goal of the summit is, well, basically to explore the opportunities of uh, trading merchant RE on the spot market, as more and more countries in Europe are, uh, yeah, and also beyond Europe, are reaching a point of market parity for uh, renewables and are also subject to the switch from a subsidy-driven market to a more market-driven situation, we are witnessing an oversupply, so to speak, of renewable energy projects, with many tenders oversubscribed and a shortage of corporate PPAs on the demand side. And therefore, selling produced energy on the spot markets is becoming increasingly important. Thus, we are assembling all stakeholders involved in development, investment, financing, management, and trading uh, of renewables. And during this event, we will discuss uh, the current renewable energy market developments and drivers, experiences and electricity price trends on the spot market, uh, the hatching of risks for RE portfolio owners, the outlook on the future value of merchant RE, and uh, yeah, many more topics. And for a more detailed overview of the sessions and of the program, uh, please uh, visit the website and have a look at the, the, yeah, the online program. Um, some final practical notes before we begin. Uh, it's possible to submit questions during the entire webinar by typing them in the questions box. And we will try to discuss all of the questions at the end of the webinar. And furthermore, in case you have technical questions, you can use the chat box. The entire webinar will be recorded as well. Uh, so the recording and the presentation slides itself uh, will be made available after the webinar, uh, but are also uh, already available for download in the handout section. Let's continue with the webinar and go to the presentation. Uh, Peter, welcome. Uh, please uh, go ahead. We will give you uh, the mouse and the controls so you can, uh, you can start your presentation. Great. Thank you, Christian. Hello, everyone. Um, as Christian said, my name is Peter Osborstone. I am Research Director for Wood Mackenzie in our European um, power markets team. Um, I'm going to talk today uh, about uh, the broader European regional power market background uh, and also then look um, at some of the specifics of low carbon growth and its economics um, set against that market background um, to highlight the drivers of growth in our view over the coming years.
So let's start by looking at the evolution of um, European power markets. We start with this graphic showing us the, the, the power market of the past. Um, from their development across Europe, power markets developed as fairly simplistic structures, fairly easy to understand, um, involving large centralized power generation, high voltage transmission, stepping down to distribution, supplying consumers at the end of that value chain. But with decarbonization, we've seen a significant development of that market model, um, such that now there are many more actors uh, in the sector and the relationship of those different system components has changed radically over the last decade or so. Um, connected now to the system in addition to that centralized generation, much more in the way of intermittent um, supply from wind and solar, um, smaller scale distributed generation, energy storage, and a much more actively involved demand side in the market, supporting market balance, um, acting on commercial opportunities evolving in the marketplace. So there's much more going on against this background, driven by this desire to decarbonize our energy mix, um, and in fact, you know, use the power sector as a key vector of the energy transition. So the materials are taken from a selection of our power markets research. Um, our research model revolves around um, data and forecasts, long-term outlook, short-term outlook work, supporting reports, topical insights and analysis, as well as um, contact with our analysts. All of our research clients have a facility um, to work directly on their analysts, the analysts responsible for the research they're looking at. Um, and I think that, that really helps to serve, differentiate the work we do. Um, I'll be showing you outputs from our European power modeling work today. Um, we're also active in the Americas and Asia Pacific. The research work we do, many of you will be familiar with, with our offerings. Um, these are packaged products. You, you know what they're gonna contain. You know the updates you're gonna get. If you have a requirement for more bespoke work, then similarly, we have a consulting team in the power and renewable space to support that. My details will be at the end of this presentation. If you require more information, then please do reach out to me. I'm more than happy to hear from you and talk about what we do in more detail. So let's start by looking at the development of European power supply. Um, a view here of power market developments over the last um, 12 or 13 years or so from a point where wind and solar generation really did very little to support overall power supply to a situation at the end of last year where PM um, power production. The overall renewable market share last year, um, end 2018, was about a third of overall supply from low carbon sources. Um, and yet you see here that the market mix remains diverse with significant contributions from all the key conventional sources. But of course, the pressures on those sources um, vary significantly. And not only at a regional level, but the significant differentiation between the pressures on those sources at a market level as well. So understanding individual markets is important in all this. Looking forwards over the next couple of decades or so, we would expect that renewable energy share of overall power supply uh, in round terms to more than double. Um, wind and solar will be major contributors to that growth over time. And the background to that growth, um, it's all very well me saying it's going to happen, but what is actually driving that growth? Um, and we see here. Um, part of the story behind that. So the renewable energy growth we've seen over the last decade or so has been delivered off the back of sustained strong policy support for decarbonisation. So climate energy policy is at the, is at the forefront of policy making uh, in Europe, driven by overarching targets, trickling down to 
national goals and national implementation plans, policy instruments, market arrangements. And we see in this chart the progression of the renewable energy share of electricity uh, on a market by market basis for each of Europe's five largest markets and the EU28 as a whole. So I've given you here outturn data for 20 uh, for 2006 and 2018 and then targets for 2020 and 2030. Um, so if anything 2018 is a midpoint between where we start this chart in 2006 and where we finish it as a target aspiration at 2030 just to illustrate that although these markets have moved an awful long way in terms of decarbonization and growth of renewables over the last few years there's still a lot of ground to cover um, these 2030 targets were taken from the uh, national energy and climate plans published by each of the respective um, member states some of them explicitly um, quantify the contribution of renewables in power. In others, we've inferred the share of renewable power based on what we know about the power supply mix or the energy supply mix of the markets concerned. Um, but overall, you know, the theme here is continued um, strong targeted growth over time. And these targets require um, appropriate legislative and commercial frameworks at a market level to attract the necessary investment. So this supports our view of continued strong growth in wind and solar in particular over the next decade and more. But of course, adding all of that low carbon power supply um, into European power markets isn't without its, its consequences. Um, so the low cost, low marginal cost nature of wind and solar power production um, has implications for pricing conditions and price setting in particular in power markets as penetration levels of those renewable technologies begin to rise. And the chart on the left hand side of this slide um, highlights that quite nicely. This is based on 2018 outturn data based on as renewable penetration increases um, expectations or the, the day ahead prices um, decline and we're showing here data for the UK, Germany, Italy and Spain. So at 50% wind and solar feed in and above um, pricing levels begin to drop off very rapidly um, below 30 euros towards zero. But the interesting thing here is that the time distribution of that pricing still is, is weighted towards the nighttime hours, the lower demand hours, rather than the daytime hours when perhaps solar in higher levels of penetration could have more of an influence on price setting. So those midnight to 7 a.m. hours still play a large part in that overall distribution of low priced hours. But that will change. And that is just the market as it is now. As we see increased renewable um, growth, increasing renewable penetration in these markets, this pricing cannibalization has become more and more of an issue during daytime hours. Of um, Germany, um, a couple of years here, 2018 and 2025. Um, each of the sort of groups of colored dots in these charts, um, each of the colors represents a different technologies you see there on the chart legend. So we have gas, coal, solar, on and offshore wind. Each of the points on this chart represents an average hour, um, average hour price for that technology relative to the average system price is shown as zero on the horizontal axis. So any dots, any data point to the right of that is uh, an average price being up by that technology, which is above system average. And then to the left represents an average system price below, an average capture price below the system price. So the flexible technologies, in particular in 2018, is positioned earning a premium on the average price, um, but at fairly low volumes of contribution. In comparison, coal 
makes a much larger contribution, but is capturing much closer to the average price. And then the renewables are located below system average price. Um, and there's an interesting spread here. The, the wind capture prices, they're very closely clustered representing time and nighttime production um, and the capacity factors there remaining fairly flat. And then the solar spread is much, much wider, representing that peak of, of daytime production. Now, if we roll, roll forwards, um, quite a lot happens. And this, I think, helps to illustrate that there are many moving parts in these power markets. So in Germany, for instance, over this time scale, in the background to this, we see the completion of the nuclear phase out. We see coal beginning to be impacted by the coal phase out. That won't be completed until the late 2030s, but it begins to become a factor. And also the relative economics of coal and gas are moving around as well. So coal is a little less competitive in 2025 against gas than it was in 2018. We've seen a lot of that in 2019 already with changing fuel and carbon prices, but that's maybe an aside at this point. So we've got generally more gas generation. It's flexibility is allowing it to capture a higher average price. Um, and then we've got larger volumes of wind um, on the system and solar. You'll notice at this point also the realized price scale on the right hand chart is much larger as well. So there is more variation there. There's more impact coming through in this of that price cannibalization effect we began to look at in that last slide. So our solar um, PV capacity forecast, and in fact, the track record of capacity build in solar over time. Uh, we can show a similar view um, of, of wind, but over the next few slides, I'll be concentrating on European solar. Um, and you know, looking at history, we had a peak in, in solar additions around 2011, Germany and Italy both adding seven and eight gigawatts um, in that year each. Uh, Germany going through a patch of years where it was adding as a market about seven gigawatts per year for three years on the turn. And then we saw um, a change in the market background. We began to see um, the transition from those generous um, subsidy, subsidy arrangements, um, which were very effective in, in attracting investment if, if at the same time and they were disruptive to power markets um, at the same time. We saw a transition around sort of 2012, 2013 to 2015, moving away from those subsidy regimes, those, those fairly blunt but effective objects, to more competitive auction arrangements. Um, and increasingly as we get sort of into the forecast period, into the early 2020s, more and more in the way of merchant and PPA-backed investments in new solar capacity. So we're expecting a peak um, in excess of what we saw in 2011 around the early 2020s. A little bit of a settling back after that, but, but nowhere near the, sort of the marked drop off that we saw around 2013, 2014. Another feature of this growth expectation is, is also that it's spread more evenly across markets. This isn't just about one or two headline markets having a rush on capacity additions for a short period of time and then falling away. This is more evenly a spread across the region than the sort of growth trends we saw in the past. But what about the background to that and the business model options? So let me explain what this chart is, is um, telling us. So on this slide, we've got two sort of business um, model outlines. The conventional business model that we would have seen sort of supporting that historical growth and then perhaps where we are today, where, where, the, where the market is going to, the future business model options as we describe them here. So rising from the bottom, bottom of the slide upwards, you know, as we go up the slide, then the risk of the um, business models and outlines, as outlined here, increases. So the low risk stuff is at the bottom, the higher risk stuff is further up this stack of available options. And the size of each of the boxes represents um, 
our our thoughts on 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 the relative opportunity size of those particular business options so if we look at the conventional um business model stack um historical growth in wind and solar was all about government subsidy schemes those fairly you know, those those blunt objects i mentioned just a moment ago feed-in tariffs green certificates um providing at times generous levels of support to but let's Let's face it, what were higher cost technologies at the time? Um, yeah, there's the bulk of the market. And a small number, a very small volume in comparison of, of merchant vest investment opportunities um, in that sort of historical market makeup. So looking forwards, what changes? Oh, there's still an element there of, of government, government subsidy support schemes, those feed-in tariffs with green certificates are still part of the market, but they are a much, much smaller part than they have in the past. Now sort of representing the majority of the market are um, bilateral PPAs between project developers um, and utilities, traders, or commercial industrial offtakers. Uh, and what we've described here is quasi-emergent investments. So in the case of those sort of projects, uh, we are looking at uh, investments where um, economics are supported by um, PPAs in part, but also with some degree of exposure to mer merchant market conditions. So that mer merchant market exposure may take place during the PPA or after the PPA. Um, yeah, it all depends on the market situation you find yourself in and the deal that's on offer at the time. In general, what we see is a shortening of um, the support period being offered in PPA arrangements, um, be those government sponsored or commercial. Um, and that means realistically, many projects now face a much longer merchant tail um, with either you know, pure merchant operation in those periods or some other form of PPA support. And there's also an area of the market we still recognize as, as pure merchant investments. It's larger than it has been in the past, but it's still a relatively small part of the overall mix, and it still sits there at the top of that risk return um, profile. So against that background, continued renewable policy support, um, the transformation of commercial arrangements, uh, this move from um, limited choice in, in, in the options for delivering projects to much more diverse market conditions with alternative business models accessible. Um, this is what our, our, our solar project pipeline is looking like. Um, subsidy free um, specifically, um, this is based on our, our project tracking, so it's based on announced projects of various um, stages. You can see that on the left hand side from operational to to pre-contract um, projects, um, totaling some 17 gigawatts uh, in Europe at present um, across those markets we mentioned. Spain, by far and away, the most active market for subsidy free PV. Um, Southern Europe being generally um, far better located and, and, and capable of offering attractive returns for PV investors. Um, Italy features strongly there. Portugal as well, and we will talk about Portugal again in more detail in a few moments. What we also provide a view of on this chart is the number of PPAs being signed for solar PVs, um, split here by quarter, and we can see the growing momentum behind the volume of deals being struck in Europe now. So a fairly strong, steady stream of deals um, struck over 2019, quieting off in Q3 over the summer months. That's Probably not a surprise, but I think we would expect that to be to be resurrected, that level of activity again as we move into the winter, and people come back to doing a little bit more business again. So let's now look at Portugal in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm sure you'll be aware of, of the recent headlines surrounding um, Portugal's first solar auction. Um, some really interesting information coming out of that. Um, so. We'll start by looking um, at the uh, the pipeline in solar. Um, so prior to the auction, 
uh, project pipeline in Portugal um, was relatively active. It's a little under one gigawatt, 938 megawatts of uh, PV um, with connection agreements. And uh, then in July, um, or the results in July, um, culminate with the culmination of an auction arrangement for up to 1.4 gigawatts of uh, new projects uh, without one of these agreements you can't go ahead and build solar this year the agreement comes with um, connection rights as well so these are pretty important deals to strike um, now of that 1.4 maximum 1.4 gigawatts um, just over um, well, 1150 megawatts were signed and the lowest price recorded in the auction was a shade under 15 euros. It was a new record um, for solar auctions, not just in Europe, but a new global record for solar auctions. Um, now, we would urge a little bit of caution around comparing one price to another, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to compare like for like in the results of these auctions. But regardless of that difficulty, um, 14 euros and 76 cents per megawatt hour is a very low price proving the maturity um, of the technology now in Europe and the suitability of Southern European markets for hosting solar developments at very competitive costs. And there are two models here um, within the auction, just to add a little bit more complexity, um, around how bidders could enter the market. So this general remuneration, um, which uh, in which case the developer actually makes a payment to the system operator for its connection uh, and then earns revenue for its production in the wholesale market. So um, Iberdrola, for example, was successful um, in bidding projects into the market on that basis. And then it was the guaranteed remuneration arrangement you know, closer to a, to a conventional support agreement um, with a fixed price PPA um, being paid for every megawatt generated and that's paid on a, on a, on a CFD basis. So overall, um, through the auction, we saw 862 megawatts signed on the guaranteed remuneration basis and a smaller volume, 288 megawatts signed under uh, general remuneration. But, yeah, what does that mean? And that's a very competitive price. Will these projects make money? Um, will they be successful investments? So to look at that, we need to understand the pricing conditions um, in Portugal. And here we see a forecast, our forecast of um, wholesale power prices in Portugal up until 2040. That's the yellow line in that left-hand chart. Um, there's an influence there, quite a strong influence there and certainly in the short to medium term around changing um, fuel costs and carbon costs across Europe, um, and then a longer term trend of increasing prices um, towards the end of the period. But as renewable penetration grows, what we're also showing is the average annual PV capture price on this chart. And you see there's an increasing gap there as we see more low carbon generation in the market, the gap between the capture price for PV and the market price begins to open up. So we can see there over the top of the chart, the, 20, the, sort of the um, initial 15 year PPA period, and then the merchant tail period beginning sort of around the early to mid 2030s. And on the right hand side, um, a quick look at how that uh, capture price, that kind of market, that price cannibalization, cannibalization is developing over time. So we've got a price differential there which is quickly approaching around 10 euros per megawatt hour um, into the 2040s. And what we did against that background um, was then look at some of the project economics. And we've assumed um, using the, the outputs from the auction, a worst and best case um, scenario. So these are kind of, I suppose you could say, these, these are the, the um, outer extremities of, of an envelope of potential outcomes for these investments. And we see the key, some of the key assumptions supporting those best and worst cases. So we've got a higher capex for the worst case, um, better in OM costs for the best case, 
um, some differential there between the annual capacity factors um, and just the general, you know, the standard 15 year PPA, we presume both being signed at around about the 15 euro per megawatt hour mark. Now, in the worst case, um, based on uh, real rates of return, equity rates of return, uh, prices begin to see a positive return around a sort of 30 euro mark. In the best case, that positive re return begins to emerge in the low 20s. And you can see there also that pink bar is our long term PV capture price range. So at around that sort of pricing level, the difference between the best and the worst case projects, well, okay, the best price, best case projects seeing an equity return of perhaps 6% real, and our worst case maybe 4%, so there's about a 2% gap there. If we then also look at the IRR WAC um, spread, now that begins to emerge as a positive factor um, for the best case, when we're in the low 40s. In the worst case, about 10 euros higher in the low to mid in, sorry yeah 10 euros higher in the low to mid 50s so quite a significant spread there just really sort of emphasizing the point that project costs and the performance of individual projects are significant factors in this particularly when the initial bids at auction are as competitive as the ones we've seen but it does prove there is a long-term return a long-term return available for these projects so that was my last slide. Um, just a few closing thoughts. Um, the case for continued growth in renewable power in Europe is, we feel, quite compelling. The 2030 plans um, of each member state really provide a roadmap to the coming decade. That's the level of aspiration that's going to set policy making. It's going to drive the development of commercial commercial which investments are going to be made. But as that last chart slide showed, the choice of market and location, and technology, and the commercial pathway which chosen to deliver, deliver those projects into the market are critical to overall returns or eventual returns in each case. Now I've looked at in some detail at PV auction results today, um, but it would be possible for us to do exactly the same for wind. The wind finds itself in a similar situation. We could have used an example with a subsidy free investment in wind. We could have looked at the market background. We could have looked at the commercial arrangements, the price that's been agreed and signed in that initial contract, and then assessed the influence of the commercial tail for that wind investment. And we could have, in all, both those examples would have highlighted that renewables in European power have advanced to a stage of maturity far beyond that which we might have seen five years ago. These are technologies which can be brought through to market, brought through to commercial operation with little or no additional commercial support on the part of host governments. And with that, I will stop and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, uh, Peter. Very interesting to see uh, uh, yeah, the developments of long-term power prices, also how this ties in with uh, the growth of renewable capacity in the different countries. Um, we will now proceed right away with the Q&A. And in the meantime, I would like to encourage our listeners to keep submitting questions, uh, which we will try to uh, uh, discuss all of them. And for now, I see a couple of questions have already come in. Um, so I would like to pass you the, the first question, Peter. Um, uh, someone here is curious to know, um, do you have ideas about other hatching tools uh, other than PPAs? Uh, which a developer yeah, can use, can make use of. Sorry, you broke up for a little bit there, Christian. Other, other what tools? So whether there are other hatching tools than PPAs, uh, which a developer can use in the development of their projects. Um, well, I think we, we touched on a little bit of that. I mean, our, our view is, yeah, the PPAs of, of one form or another, 
and I would emphasize we you know, we touched upon various different parties, counterparties to those PPAs um, do have a significant role. Um, we do think there are potential opportunities on a purely merchant basis, but again, I showed you that, that the risk there um, is is potentially significant. Um, I would also point out that, that you know, I mentioned some of the parties that were bidding into that, that um, uh, Portuguese um, PV auction and even there you know, we saw some natural hedges in that and the behavior in that auction where some of that, that offtake would no doubt be be um, hedged into uh, the company's existing supply portfolio so yes there are alternative routes there, there um, and we've used that sort of PPA banner I think is covering a, a number of different commercial relationships that we could see developing over time with different parties involved um, in in those particular deals Okay, and um, uh, another question that uh, comes in, because you showed uh, several models, of course, and certain developments for the upcoming years beyond 2019. And I have a question here um, about the, whether you incorporated also the impact of storage in these models. Is this a factor you, you accounted for? Yes, yes, absolutely. So within um, our, our market modeling, um, work or hourly market modeling work there is an allowance in there for storage um, you know we're looking at storage as, as part of our research suite so the main elements of our research suite is, is the market chain led wind and solar work that we do and our grid edge analysis and a key part of that grid edge technology analysis is energy storage so that is integrated into our modeling we're looking at the inter um, implications there on, on more or less storage with more or less renewables and how that begins to shape um, system prices net demands yeah it's a much more interesting marketplace to model now than it has been in the past and storage is one of those things which makes it more interesting yes def definitely and uh, so uh, and beyond storage, do you think there are other uh, potential factors that could still yeah, disrupt the scenarios you, uh, you have showed us? Um, uh, are there, what, what are the most uncertain elements that could have a big impact on, yeah, on, these, uh, on these scenarios, you think? Or are you fairly confident if, that it will play out the way as you sketched? <laughs> there's, there's always uncertainty in these views. Um, that what you've seen today are, are various extracts from our base case um, but of course there there are many ways in which you can build sensitivities and scenarios around that view I mean look at the um, climate energy plans of, of individual governments and, and some of the um, projections of those governments about how they go about achieving deeper levels of decarbonization some of the technologies they choose it isn't always about the cheapest route if, if we consider wind and solar at lower cost to be the cheapest routes. Um, and I think it's, it's a good point to, to ask just after a storage question, system flexibility and flexibility of supply is an important aspect of, of our thinking in the longer term. And it's something that we need to focus much more on as, as we move forwards, because we don't have the, the residual flexibility that traditional mark power market structure provides as older coal and, and gas plants begin to be left lost from the system. Um, so there are lots of moving parts. Um, there are numerous uncertainties. There are alternative low carbon technologies there, including um, conventional fossil fuel sources with carbon capture, for example, any range of, of power to X, power to gas, for instance, options for providing um, a route for otherwise excess renewable power to market and to provide additional value in those, in those sessions. So, yep. Yeah, it's something we continue to look at and we are more than happy to talk to people about as well. So we have uh, we have a ton of questions uh, coming in. So um, uh, we have to make a selection uh, regarding uh, uh, very relevant questions. Um, a couple of people are wondering whether you can elaborate a bit on the distinction between realized and captured price. So uh what 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 does its distinction exactly mean and also um uh, following on that uh what are the assumptions or why why does the solar realized prices keep improving uh in 
2025, in addition to the increased terawatt hours? Um, I think we're we talking about the Portuguese price there, maybe. Um, I think, is, is there a specific slide reference on that? Or is, are we uh, the slide wasn't stated in the question, no. but um, let me have a quick look. I think it it might be related. Um, um, let me have a brief look. No, I'm actually I'm actually not. Oh, I think I think that the the slide about the changing price dynamics at the beginning of your presentation uh, realized capture oh, prices. Right, okay. that's, right yeah, through. that's 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 so that's the. German, that's the one, that's the German market price example. I mean, you can substitute realized prices for capture prices here. They are, in this case, I think, substitutable terms. We've used realized prices, and I do appreciate it. Elsewhere in the presentation, I've used capture prices. But yeah, these, this, is, this is pointing to you know, what does a generator running a particular technology in that market at that time achieve for its production? And, and that doesn't matter whether we're talking about a conventional technology or a renewable technology. Um, and, and Germany has in power markets. Germany has perhaps more moving parts than many others. I mentioned the retirement of, of nuclear. That has a bearing on the German power supply mix. Um, it, it has a bearing on the net balance of that market. And we are expecting you know, renewable um, power supply growth to make good some of that loss of supply or increasingly make good that loss of supply that Germany suffers as a result of its nuclear retirement. But then at the same time, we also see the coal retirement beginning to ramp up. If I'd used a different market as an example here, we probably would have seen more of an influence of growing solar penetration over time and um, a greater occurrence of or greater prevalence of um, price cannibalization, simply because I've used Germany and because so many we see solar losing too much value. So, so think back to one of the other slides I showed where a lot of low priced hours were still occurring overnight, then the combination of those two factors, supply change and the timing of the low priced hours is sufficient in 2025 for solar not to be used, losing too much value in Germany. As we progress through the period and that solar growth continues, um, then I would expect to see more in the way of cannibalization emerge and that solar average hourly capture price, average hourly realized price to move more towards the left. So, and um, furthermore, you discussed you 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 discussed a case study uh, about uh, Portugal, of course, and mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of questions coming in regarding Portugal. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, someone is curious about your your opinion on the end result of the auction, uh, but also um, in the in the models you showed, uh, there's a question about your assumption for the project lifetime. So, do you think bidders are modeling? Uh, on a 35 or 40 year operational life? Um, I think probably 35, I think we're talking about 30 plus. I think for the case of, of that um, analysis, I believe I'd have to check we used 30 years. So we had a operational life that was split right down the middle, 30, 15 years of, of initial PPA support and then 15 years um, of merchant operation or, or, or other support measures beyond the initial contract. But yes, it would be possible to look at that over a longer period. And we've been a little bit conservative in, in choosing perhaps a slightly shorter one in this case. Um, and furthermore, uh, for, um, yeah, when it comes to nuclear, um, you showed the uh, decon uh, decommissioning of the nuclear fleet uh, over time. And um, th the question here is that that should have a, a bigger negative price impact for, for solar and wind, while the models you showed uh, uh, explained uh, the PV prices to, to be improving. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? 
I think that's possibly looking at uh, Germany again. Um, those were just snapshots. We would need to look at a longer period of time to really see the market conditions for solar and, and tr properly track how they develop. Part of any sort of movement in there for solar, I think, is partly masked by the fact we were on a larger scale on the right hand chart. So that does tend to move um, things around a little bit. Um, I don't think those market conditions are, are materially better for solar. They're about the same over that sort of time period. However, you know, we saw in the other slide, in the Portugal slide, where we looked at market price and solar capture price, there was an open, there was a widening gap over time. And that's 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 a similar trend. Germany's going to follow a similar trend over time. It's just like gone 2018, 2025, and there just isn't enough time, I think, there beyond the reshaping of the German supply mix to see that gap begin to open up again. Um, unrelated to uh, the specific contents of this presentation, uh, some people are wondering whether your research also covers Asia and the Americas in, in, in equal depth, uh, or is, is that less your focus? Are you mainly focused on Europe? Or Yes, we have, we have a significant team um, based in the States in particular, um, a market modeling team um, located in Houston, and then a substantial uh, wind, solar, and grid edge um, practice as well. Our overall power renewables sort of suite of, of research has developed um, in recent years from from Wood McKenzie's sort of background of market modeling. We've had a distinct gas and power presence at sort of parallel research offerings in, in the States for well over 10 years now. Um, and then sort of more latterly, we as, as a business acquired um, two further research houses. Um, the first of those was uh, Green Tech Media, um, GTM, as, as some people may be familiar with. Um, and they brought to us um, solar expertise and, and grid edge expertise, research and consulting. And then more recently, two and a half, three years or so ago, um, we acquired a business called Make Consulting, um, based in Denmark, uh, a wind research consultancy um, house. So that's really sort of built out the breadth of our capability. And we're now using our market models to sit in the middle of that technology-led analysis to really gel all of that together to build as, as coherent and, and um, persuasive a story around power market development as we can. And I should just further add before I end that point, we've maintained at the same time all of the close integration we have um, going back over, over a number of years with our broader fuels research. So our power markets work is directly connected to our fuel market work. We work very closely, for example, with our global gas model team around understanding the demand for gas in European power and the pricing of that gas as well. Okay, thank you for elaborating on that. And uh, beyond the marks I just mentioned, uh, have you also done studies in, in Africa and uh, particularly the West African market? We do cover a number of African markets. Um, we do, in terms of published research, um, the work tends to be at a slightly higher level of detail, um, but we are um, conversant with market conditions in a number of market African markets, particularly West Africa. Um, and again, Wood Mackenzie's background in oil and gas kind of helps us there. Those are markets that we've been familiar with for a long period of time. Um, and um, we do offer research in those in those market spaces. We do also offer consulting um, um, projects or, or solutions for more ad hoc requirements as well. Okay, so I, I would suggest to uh, to cover two more questions before we uh, before we round off uh, this Q and A. Uh, we still have uh, some interesting questions coming in. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, proxy revenue swaps in a merchant market? Is this a, a viable alternative to PPAs in, in your opinion? That's not a topic that, that I have any specific uh, insight into. I would need to refer that to my colleagues. Um, if, if the person asking that question um, would like to reach out to me, I'll, I'll, I'll connect them with the relevant member of our team. 
Perfect. I'm uh, I'm sure that will be uh, that will be possible. And moving on to um, yeah to the to the final question. Um, of course, we spent quite some time talking about Portugal. You showed a slide of uh, several countries and their uh, their renewables, their PV deployment. Uh, uh, over time, do you expect uh, after the current developments in the auctions, to, do you expect the Portuguese market to have a visible side uh, when you compare it to uh, uh, yeah in a side comparison between between the different countries? Uh, do you, how, how how quickly will that go in, yeah to your to your idea? Um, sorry, Christian, I'm not quite sure I follow the question. Yeah, so so uh, of course uh, Portugal is now not included yet uh, when you oh, yes, when you yeah. chart the biggest countries in Europe. But mm -hmm. do you expect them to have a visible side a size uh, anytime soon? Um, yeah. So so Portugal here is is captured in that in that other category. That data is in there. We are capturing that pipeline of projects and our expectations. Um, for the commissioning of new capacity. Um, we could add it in. Um, it would remain a fairly small part of that mix, I think, which is why we chose to keep it out. Um, it may be sort of in, in the early 2020s, maybe around the sort of size of, of that United Kingdom entry around about that time, maybe a little bit bigger. But you know, in contrast, we've, we've put the UK in because we saw that, that boost well, that surging growth around 2015. Portugal would would be a smaller part of this mix. Um, it wouldn't be sort of in there in the history very much. Um, and it's, it's forecast contribution as a small market would be relatively small at a, at a, in a regional level as well. But we can certainly split that data out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um... I suggest we uh, we nice round question. off uh, the Q and A. Thanks for taking uh, the extensive time to uh, to answer all these questions uh, from our audience. And this will also be uh, the end of the webinar. I hope everyone has been enjoying the discussion today. And as I uh, told before, the recordings uh, and the slides will be available on the website soon. Um, so I would uh, encourage everyone to subscribe for updates uh, uh, or register right away on our event website. Please keep in mind that uh, the early bird price expire coming Friday already. And furthermore, uh, also important to mention is that there are still opportunities to be involved in this event. So if you have any questions or if you want to be involved in any way, please reach out to me uh, um, to discuss this further and explore uh, the potential ways uh, we can arrange, it, uh, arrange this. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Peter, for the presentation. And uh, I'm looking forward to welcoming uh, everyone in Frankfurt in October. Thanks, goodbye. Bye. Muted.